nonprofit fundraising section. So if you want to be in a different section, stay here anyway. Stay in. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I wanted to thank you guys for coming here and being here. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction. We're all going to introduce ourselves. My name is Marjorie Moore. I live in Illinois. I'm actually Chief of Asian Affairs for DCFS, which is the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services in Chicago, Illinois. I am also a licensed attorney, and then I'm also a executive board member of the Julian Grace Foundation. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues to explain, to introduce themselves to you. I'm Allison Lopez. I'm the executive director of the Julian Grace Foundation. We are a foundation, a um, private family foundation located just outside of Chicago. Started four years ago, so we're on the younger, newer side of foundations. Um, our mission is to um, support entrepreneurial initiatives that support a more just, hopeful world. Um, and our focus areas are education, immigration, health, environmental sustainability, and cultural preservation, mostly in the Chicagoland area um, with a few national and a few international um, initiatives that we support in Israel, Haiti, and Honduras. Um, is that it? And my background is I've worked in nonprofit for the last 15 years, uh, mostly in fundraising and executive management, executive director of, of nonprofits who were asking for money. and so. Now I'm on the side of supporting getting it out there. <laughs> um, I'm Jen Bokoff. I work for a foundation center based in New York, but there's actually a foundation center here in D.C. as well. Um, foundation Center is a national organization um, that's been around for almost, no, I guess 60 plus years now. Um, we were actually started during the McCarthy era hearings when there was a lot of skepticism about what foundations were funding, like what were they doing with all that money that they didn't really have to share too much about. So Foundation Center was created with the idea of transparency um, because uh, someone during the hearing said it would be nice if foundations had glass pockets. So um, we everything we do is with the aim of transparency. So a core of that is sharing data about who's funding what and where. Um, and as technology's grown and as we've grown, we um, work with both grant seekers, um, so nonprofit organizations in communities doing work but looking for funds. Um, we do fundraising training and connect them um, with data that they can use to do prospect research. So I'll talk more about that. And then I actually work on the side that works with foundations to help them fund more effectively. Um, so you'll hear more about that in a few minutes. And my quick background um, is I was a grant maker um, prior to this at a small family foundation. Um, and I've also worked for the IRS as a fun fact. So um, I'm not scary, I swear. <laughs> but, but it's interesting because as we'll, as we'll talk about, this whole sector is defined in the tax code. So it's, it's an interesting connection that I like to share in this context. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Jessica Sarowitz and uh, I'm one of the founding uh, partners of the Julian Grace Foundation. So, um, so it is our family who is uh, funding uh, all of the uh, activity of the foundation. We do not uh, have any other source of income or revenue. It is, like I said, our family money. Um, and my background is I actually am, I have a family office, meaning that on the aggregate level, I uh, manage the, all of the entrepreneurial assets, all of the assets of our family. So anything from entrepreneurial, and uh, so we have various lines of businesses from, we've got, we had a domestic payroll company, an uh, international payroll service company, a UK payroll service company. We, um, our family office is also uh, manages all of the private investments that we make, anywhere from 200,000 to 10 million, and um, in diverse uh, kind of sectors from uh, renewable energy to uh, logistics, um, uh, workforce uh, kind of initiatives. And um, I like to say that we're entrepreneurial in that 
what we are trying to do with our uh, family wealth is to utilize them in a creative entrepreneurial manner. So I'm actually doing a lot of thought around social impact investing right now and um, also working very closely with our foundation and trying to find those synergies between uh, business, allocating investment funds and assets, and uh, marrying or partnering with um, some social sector initiatives. So um, that's my lens, that's my focus, and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Hi everyone, I am Han Lee, I'm the Executive Director of the Weisberg Foundation. We're a small family foundation based in Arlington, Virginia. I'm non-family staff. Um, we give to advance equity. So we give to organizations and initiatives that are giving voice and opportunity to historically marginalized populations, so populations of color, those closest to incarceration, immigrants and refugees. Um, and we do that through funding, through grants, through capacity building, through amplifications of, of stories and people we think need to be heard, and through supporting and engaging collaboration. And our main giving areas are criminal justice reform, advancing racial equity, and diversity in theater. Um, so I've been with the foundation for a little over two years. Before then, I worked at Exponent Philanthropy, and that's an association of small foundations that really helps small foundations do better philanthropy that's more effective, efficient, and fulfilling. Um, and before that, I was on the, um, the grant seeking side, working for various community development organizations um, nas that are national but based in the DC area. Um, I also serve on the I also serve on the board of um, Asian American Lead, which is a youth development organization uh, in the DC metro area. Um, I co-chair the DC chapter of Asian American Pacific Islanders in philanthropy. Um, and I'm, uh, the work that I'm really excited by, about these days is with our Regional Association of Grant Makers. I co-chair our Racial Equity Working Group. So I hope that caused you guys to have a lot of questions as to what uh, foundations do and how to get involved. But before we start off with that, we'd like to know about you guys, about what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Keep you on your toes, we're gonna do it in the dark. <laughs> no! Is that we need to move? What is going on? Turn it off. So this is all a metaphor. <laughs> you don't have to fundraise. Now we're gonna talk about dark. transparency. Yeah. <laughs> Weird. Oh gosh. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> weird. I was. Oh my oh, god. Oh. It's interesting because we saw a movie last night and the lights kept coming on. We wanted them off, but they kept coming on. So this is the opposite effect. So uh, I'm not sure how to remedy that issue at all. But um, we'll just keep going. Yes, we're going to keep going. So we'd like to know the what are what you guys would like to hear about I and mean, more about you. So if you could, could you please tell us about yourself? Just you know, just a few, a minute or two, just to introduce yourself if you're part of a board or of a foundation or what your interest is here. Okay. My name is Lana Wang. Um, I was an engineer before, then I was a computer program, but uh, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, I started building homes then about a Nine years ago, I started to run assist living homes. Right now, I have seven assist living homes. Uh, at the same time, I have a non-profit uh, assist living, which uh, I partner with Baltimore, I mean Baltimore, Baltimore area, and Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. So we, I partner with homeless, Baltimore County homeless shelter. So, but homeless shelter, you normally, you can only stay there for like 90 days. After 90 days, you have to find your own, you stand on your own feet. So after 90 days, a lot of people still cannot uh, support themselves. This call, we are we come, so as a non-profit assist living, we take them in and provide them food and housing. So, so far we provide uh, about 33 people with housing and food, and currently we still have many people with, with us. We continue still to take, uh, take many people from there. So, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry about that. 
So at the same time, this February, I bought a horse farm in Montgomery County. That I plan to do a lot of um, non-profit or charity things, like with the horse. We can help people, especially people with disability, like all uh, autism people <laughs> that uh, with uh, the therapy, because we have a hundred acre beautiful place with wood, woods, with and uh, with oh. streams, with pond, very, very beautiful. So we wanted to help people there. So I was just thinking we should uh, get some money uh, to work together so we, we, can, we can help more and more people. So today just uh, I see this, I like, come here, see if you can teach me how to uh, get some funding so, so we can help more and more people. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to let you all know that we are being recorded today. So as a result, we will have to use the microphone so that the recording can pick up. I'm Nana Liu. Um, in my previous previous life that I work for in University of Michigan, we have uh, applied the government funding to help uh, inner city toy kids with asthma. And we also got grants from uh, Robert Johnson Wood Foundation. Uh, I wasn't involved in the grant writing part. Now I am part of the effort helping this UCA organization to get money. I'm thinking uh, maybe there's a way for us to 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 get into this is not profit. And also in my where I live, local um, non profit. And a lot of them they don't even know that you can get funding from charities, governments and others. So I'm here I'm very excited to learn um, the ways to help all the non profit that I Support. Thank you. Again, I want to remind you to speak into the mic so that the recording can pick up. I'll be very brief. I'm Wei He. Um, I have a PhD degree in public policy. I was one of the moderators yesterday for uh, a formative action section. And several friends uh, of mine, we had some initial, uh, initial idea about that uh, organization uh, like think tank. Uh, if you if you look at journalism and very serious public public policy study, we are thinking to um, have a um, to launch a think tank organization that is close to the serious public policy study because we we now see there is a big disconnection between the community and the academia academics and the academic community, especially Chinese between Chinese community and the American mainstream academic community. So we want to do um, something to bridge those two community. Um, um, but we still in our very early stage of thinking, we would like to gain very helpful insight from you guys about some reason. Thank you. Thank you. Again, we're asking you guys to let us know uh, if you are part of the a nonprofit, or you're a board member, or you've written a grant, or what your interest is in participating in this uh, breakout session. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for sharing today. I'm Yi Chao Li. Uh, so I grew up in China, and uh, I would work on mergers and acquisitions and IPO in finance for four years. And I got my MBA here, and then I was on board with Boston Chinese Investment Club, which is a for-profit organization for more than three years. Um, now I'm a financial advisor in a boutique wealth management firm in, based in Rockville. Uh, but the reason I'm here today is, um, I think, two. First one is, um, I think this might be the only panel with all the female um, panelists. <laughs> um, so, you know, even working in uh, mergers and acquisitions or being a financial advisor is a completely male-dominant um, industry. So I, I'm just curious, uh, as a female working in a foundation, how it works and do you feel it's challenge as a female? And the second uh, reason to be here is um, working in a nonprofit, uh, working in a nonprofit organization. And I would want to know, like, how the, how is the process of decision making working in a foundation, and what's your KPI? How do you evaluate yourself by the end of the year or some something like that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Those are great questions. Hi, everyone. 
everybody. Uh, my name is Lin. I came from Boulder, Colorado. Uh, in my former life, I, uh, I work in the tech industry, and right now I am doing more environmental uh, nonprofit work. So right now, I'm the president of uh, Innovo Foundation. It's a private grant-making foundation with a focus on uh, climate change mitigation. And I'm also serving on three uh, environmental, environmental boards in uh, Colorado area, mainly focusing on uh, statewide policy making. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, William Wan. Uh, I came from Chicago and I had nothing to do with <laughs> nonprofit <laughs> organizations <laughs> in this country. All my work is centered in the, India. 18 years ago, I went to India to take pictures, as you know, that I, mean, I always carry my camera. And um, one time I um, heard a story that two girls were left uh, homeless. Their father killed the mother and the child fell into pieces. And the high priest told me that if you want to help this uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, little town called Pushka, uh, then you come in the morning and then we'll see them. And I went back in the morning, that was the day I checked out, and I couldn't find them. So I'm very disappointed. I really want to help these two girls. And then I went, to, went back to my hotel and told the owner, he said, oh, I know them, they are my relatives. So to make it short, I came to know them, one is four, one is seven, and I at once um, put in uh, a lot of money, uh, as trust money in the bank. Um, and every year I go back, I put money in, in the bank for them. And uh, then I lost touch with them. And then two years ago, I found them. And now one of them is 18 years old, one is 21. One graduated with um, BA and then got a master degree. And then another one, in fashion design, and she's most uh, sought after fashion designer. And, I, and they say to me, I could touch my heart, and that is, if not because of you, we wouldn't be here. Uh, so I thought, well, money does carry a lot of weight. But in between all these 18 years, I've been going back to the, um, this is not, not Gypsy family, but I also have a large crowd, a large uh, camp of Gypsy families about 40, 50 families I'm helping each year by putting money in the grocery store so they can go there and get the monthly ration of flour and I put money in the bank for people who are pregnant, they expect to have babies. I put money in, in the school, send kids to school and also when I'm there I do a little bit of surgery because I'm trained in surgery, in medicine and also a dentist. Um, but nobody wants to, to see me as a dentist. <laughs> so anyway, for all these people, I try to do one thing, and that is to change the fate one, one face at a time. I don't want to give them money. I want to help them to make a living on their own. So I put in a lot of money to invest um, uh, in them, a, a means to make a living. So I put in a lot of money. Now there's another photographer, American boy who also have a great heart for the chief families. So we've set up the school with 50 students and we trained uh, three teachers and, and we have to provide food, not only for the children, but also for the children's families. Otherwise, the parents will not send the kids to us. Otherwise, they would be back in the streets. So there's a lot of money involved and it's all our money. And uh, he is exhausting all his money and I try to help as much as I can because and, and I know that we try to set up a non-profit organization, but we want to be very transparent. We don't know how to do it. And I use my own money all the time. I don't mind doing that because money is not money unless you use it. Okay? But I think it would be great uh, to see the fate of these people change their life completely altered so that they would be on a path of uh, not prosperity but a very comfortable and so I want to hear in this organization how to make a non-profit organization to raise money uh, not for me but for the rest of the uh, gypsy families and they are very poor, very very poor, they live in huts uh, with a tent and in summer it's pouring down in the winter it's very very cold, the sand doesn't keep heat so for them I 
I need your advice. It's so I'm here. Thank you. In the interest of time, I want to remind you that we're asking for you to introduce yourself and what your interest is in being here. Whether you're a board member, um, if you're a nonprofit, or you're a grant writer. So I want to make sure that we get to the substance of what you're here for. So for those who just came, I'll give you some time to think about it. Oh. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Jason Wong. Um, I'm currently a um, senior transportation advisor in a commission, federal commission called Appalachian Regional Commission. So uh, my task is to uh, our whole commission that uh, this is over 50 years uh, federal funded the program and help Appalachian Region, which covers 13 states. And there really is a help, help American poor and for the economic development. But my part is for the um, transportation development because of my background in tra transportation engineer and highway engineer. I give back what I'm so interested in this session is 20 years ago I helped our oh, main funder. We founded the Overseas Transportation Association, which all the transportation related professionals came to this country from graduate study or in working here. Uh, there we founded this organization, but after 20 years, uh, since I, I'm already out of the board, but the you know, advisory role, but for the over 20 years, they are still based on a volunteer basis. It's, it, it, the operation is really, uh, it's amateur. So I'm trying to advise them to seek those kind of getting the fundraising is non-profit. It's already registered as non-profit, but it just doesn't have those uh, income to come to support full-time staff in the operation. <laughs> right now, so much demand, even each year we were invited by different Chinese uh, universities to host big conference in China, but yet we're still like very poor, doesn't have any money, consistent money or money money stream income to support those kind of activities. So that's what I'm trying to come in. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, my name is Chao Yu Zi from Indiana. Um, I'm one of the board members of uh, UCA United Chinese Americans. Two reasons coming here. Uh, first, the, uh, financial sustainability is one of the top priority for the, uh, the long-term existence of UCA. The second in the uh, state of Indiana, um, so we set up some foundation work to try to form a consortium to get all the Asian Americans together uh, to promote, educate the local Asian America to be civically engaged. Uh, so um, I, I come here to learn how to do the fundraising. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This is a very interesting um, panel for me. My name is Joanne Wong. I work for Bank of America on the Family Trust, Family uh, Private Foundation side. Um, I came uh, from a capital market experience, so for 15 years I was actually helping business owners from China to raise capital in the U.S. But about four or five years ago, I switched to the family side, the family planning, you know, the the trust level, um, wealth management, and all that. And I realized a lot of those um, very ambitious, very efficient Chinese business owners currently um, all have the tendency to you know, form a um, pretty large size of family foundation, but they do lack the understanding of what it means to have that structure. And they are seeking actually mentorship uh, from their American counterparts. And, you know, we as a financial platform, we try to uh, pair them together, introduce them to a network where they can learn and innovate and customize their original ideas to really make something different in their community and then in general, you know, country. Thank you. Um, um, my name is Ann Shaw, and uh, I'm a UCA, Illinois, and national board member. I, I've served on nonprofit boards for, oh my God, I'm getting old, over 20 years. <laughs> so um, I'm always interested on generating revenue for our organizations and sustainability. So I can't wait to hear from all of you. Thank you. 
Thank you, and in the interest of time, um, we're going to get started on the content of the presentation today. So, uh, Jen Volkoff introduced herself to you, and she's going to start us off with uh, information with regard to the nonprofit fundraising and foundations. Thank you very much, and thanks again for having me here. Um, I'm going to start with some remarks just framing what it is we're talking about um, when we're talking about fundraising, and today we'll be talking specifically with the lens of foundation fundraising. Um, so I'll, I'll share a couple thoughts and I'll also pause to get any clarifying questions because it sounds like some of you are in this field and you know how philanthropy works, but for a lot of you it's maybe a, a curiosity, something where you've thought, huh, it'd be nice to maybe get some money to do this thing I'm passionate about, but I don't really know how. So I'll start with just a few minutes of, of thoughts and then feel free to think about any clarifying questions about the field of philanthropy. Um, so just to start, there, there's a lot of forms of mission-driven work. Wow. Wow. Ghost stories. Yeah, exactly. Just powerful here. Okay, so there's a lot of different structures for mission-driven work, but in general, when you're working toward a mission, you need funds to support that mission. And I can't look at my notes, so I'm just going to talk. Um, and huh. All right. Well, we can always switch to ghost stories, um, but for now, I'll just keep going despite the lights. So, um, money can come from any number of places, and I think the one that most of us are most familiar with, because it happens the most interpersonally, is just from people, from people that we know. Um, so one like really common example of fundraising from people that you know is when someone in your community is running a fundraiser. It could be a bake sale, it could be that they're doing a race or a walk in honor of someone, um, it could be for their child's school, and they'll say, hey, um, you know, can you support this cause? And you might take out your checkbook and write a check, and that is one form of giving. That is individual giving. And for some organizations and some mission-driven causes, that's fine. Um, fundraising from individuals is enough money. Um, and especially after the election, there are examples like the, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, in one weekend fundraised six times the amount of money that they had gotten in a whole year just from individuals. So it, what's nice about fundraising from individuals is that it's often a response to something that's happening. Um, it could be a response to something in the world or a response to a direct ask. And on some level, it's the easiest because there isn't as much red tape. You make an ask and someone can decide yes or no if they'll write a check. But when we're trying to build sustainable organizations, usually it's not a good idea to just rely on individual donors alone. So we look to other sources of money. Um, and the government and businesses are like two other places that funds can come from. Both of those similarly, you know, they can be great and they also might not be sustainable because a business could change what it wants to invest in, the government could come under new leadership or shift its priorities. Um, so again, like these are great sources of funds, but we still want to diversify more. So there's another source of funds, um, which is what we're here to talk about today, which is funds that come from foundations. Um, and so, so again, you wanna diversify your portfolio for sustainability, but also when you partner with foundations, you get new resources. Um, those resources aren't just money, um, but you're building your network, you're building access to other organizations and people that might be interested in the same issues that you're interested in. Um, and one grant from one foundation can also get you more grants from more foundations. So it has a really nice trickle down effect. So what is a foundation? Um, I said in the beginning, I think half the room missed it, um, I used to work for the IRS 
and I'm totally not scary, I promise. Um, but the IRS is actually uh, pretty unique in the whole world because in the whole world, we are the only country that defines its nonprofit sector through the tax code entirely. So foundations are actually defined in the tax code. Um, and there's kind of two forms that a foundation might take with a lot of subforms. So one is called an operating foundation. And an operating foundation is an entity that would run its own mission-driven programs. Um, and, and then there are grant-making foundations, which is what we're here to talk about today. Um, and grant-making foundations also have a lot of different forms they can take. So one example, someone mentioned Robert Wood Johnson earlier. That's a great example of a private foundation. Um, private foundations can be completely independent, um, but they might also be family foundations, um, which a lot of folks have some experience with, and um, our panelists up here are all from family foundations, so they'll, they'll speak to some of those fun dynamics, I'm sure. Um, there are corporate foundations, and as you might guess, corporate foundations are tied to business interests. Um, and then there are also grant-making public charities, um, and the best example of that that you probably have in your own community is some sort of community foundation. So I live in New York City, I'm in Brooklyn, so we have a Brooklyn Community Foundation. And what grant-making public charities do is they both fundraise and make grants. Um, so what's important to know about the way tax code defines foundations is that they need to spend at minimum 5% of their money, of their assets, every year on mission-related investments. So you might think, oh, that's 5% that's going toward grant making. Well, it probably is, but also they might be able to support research, for example, that might not be in the form of a grant, but it's to build understanding and advance the mission that the foundation was set up with. Um, a pretty common question that I just wanna like get out in the way at the beginning is like, well, can they do advocacy? Can they do lobbying? Like, there's a lot going on. We have things to fight for. What can foundations do? And the answer is like, yes, but. Um, it's always complicated. It's, it's a legal question. Um, so I wanted to refer you to one of my favorite resources out there if that is a particular line of questioning for you. Um, and that's called the Alliance for Justice. Um, they put out a lot of great free resources that really get into tax law and how you might want to structure any lobbying or advocacy work that you're doing either as a foundation or a nonprofit. Um, and that will also help you all who are fundraising to understand where you might get funds for those sorts of activities. Okay, so we've talked about what a foundation is. Um, so, and I said that they make grants, but like, what are these grants? What could they look like? What forms do they take? Um, so from an approach perspective, they might fund any number of things. The, my favorite kind is what's called general operating support. And general operating support is literally support that is otherwise unallocated. It's just going to your cause. Um, and you can apply that however you want. So that could be to support the costs of the building, it could be to support salaries, it could be to buy pens for all the desks, it could be for travel expenses. It's however you deem that money best spent. So that is sometimes also called flexible support. General operating support, flexible support, all the same thing. The interesting thing with that, and we can get more into this on the panel if it's a curiosity for folks, um, a lot of foundations say that they like the idea of that, but they don't want to fund overhead. So overhead is what they refer to as like the operating expenses of staff costs and like kind of the boring things that are really necessary and essential to like keep activities happening in organizations, but that aren't necessarily the sexy, exciting, directly mission-related activities. So that's just something to keep in mind um, as you're looking for grants, like will a foundation fund general support or does it need to be a different kind of support? So what are other kinds of support? Um, the most common is program support. So program support is if you're doing something specific um, that you want to get funding for, 
that would be funding a program. So from the first woman who spoke, we heard about courses and like how can we bring more people to engage with them and I, we'd have to have a whole side conversation to know exactly what you're looking to do, but just to bring that in as an example, let's say that you wanted a program where once a week for eight weeks, people with disabilities could come and engage with the horses. That is a concrete example of a type of program that you could fundraise for. And for every program that you fundraise for, it would have a program budget and you would know exactly what the costs are over a period of time that go into that program. And that's what a foundation would need to see to be able to think about funding. Um, another type of support is called capacity building support. Um, capacity building support can come in many shapes and sizes. Um, it could be a $5,000 grant to attend a conference in Europe to learn about how other funders are talking about climate change, or it could be a $50,000 investment in your sabbatical. Um, these are some recent examples that I've looked at, but capacity building essentially is like, how are we building the skills and resources of a foundation to do what it does, of an organization to do what it does. Then there's capital support, which we won't talk about much today, but that's like overall investment in like some of the some of the actual like assets that you need as a organization to operate. So like investment in a building um, or other like hard costs. Um, and then there's increasingly another investment strategy um, of rapid response grants. And I wanted to make sure I brought that into the room because from the conversations that have happened earlier today. Um, that I was able to sit in on, I've gotten a sense that there are a lot of urgent issues that folks are facing in their communities and more broadly. And so there are grant makers who specifically want to make grants in direct response to things that are happening, and they want to do it quickly. So they don't want to take six months to go through a grant cycle. They want to hear your need now, and they want to fund it now. Um, and one example even from my work, so I work for a nonprofit organization that works in philanthropy, um, but there's a foundation that actually um, we're applying to right now. They're giving rapid response grants for communications needs. So if you have something that you urgently need to communicate about but didn't have bandwidth or kind of the right people or things in place, it's like open to anyone um, to apply for $10,000 in like a quick, like less than 30 day turnaround. So that's pretty neat. Um, something else that kind of layers on top of any of these types of grants is something called matching grants. Um, a match is a really, really, really great way to build your portfolio. And the way that a matching grant would be structured is, let's say you have a fundraising goal of $100,000 for a specific effort. A funder might say, we'll fund you 50,000 if you can find the other 50,000. And we'll even help make introductions to make that possible. So you could balance the 50,000 maybe with an individual donor campaign, but you might also leverage it to say, hey, this brand name foundation says they're gonna give me money, but only if we get this amount from others. So you might get that in $10,000 grants, you might get another foundation of the same size to give another $50,000 grant, but it's really a way to leverage fundraising. And especially if you're new to fundraising from foundations, it's something really interesting to consider because funders understand the value of that leverage. Um, there was also a question at some point of like, well, can we get multiple grants from one foundation? Uh, and the answer is absolutely. Um, it's not gonna happen overnight, but especially for capacity building grants and capital investments and rapid response grants, uh, go back to the same funders that you've gotten general support or program support from. Um, and they absolutely will consider your requests um, because they already know you. And that's, that's kind of a bigger theme in funding right now. It's about building relationships with grantee organizations and the individuals who run them, um, rather than just sort of one-off grants. Um, a few other things that funders look at when they're deciding if they're going to make a grant, they look at the population that the grant will be serving, they look at the geography, like literally the, the area of people who will be affected by the grant that they make, they look at the budget, so like, 
how much money are you asking for from the foundation relative to the budget that you've laid out. Um, they look at leadership. They want to know not only who's running your mission-driven effort, but also like who's on your board, who's steering this stuff. And for all of this, they're looking to see if it's in line with their mission and their mandate. Um, there are some foundations, for example, the, the one I used to work for, um, our mission statement was that we promote access and opportunity for all New Yorkers. The reality was, you know, we cared about doing that in X, Y, and Z ways. So a lot of figuring out like, like, well, who do I apply to? You need to do your research to see like, is my population served and is my geo area and is my budget in line with what this foundation wants to do? Um, I want to quickly touch on decision-making processes as well, like how do the actual grant decisions get made, um, since we're talking about a lot of money that goes through a lot of foundations, and like, who's in control of that? And the reality is that at most foundations, it's the board that ratifies decisions. Um, it, foundations can have anywhere from one to, I think the most I know about is 12 board meetings a year. Um, and at those meetings, they, um, they vote and they decide, you know, who gets funded. But they're usually doing that based on recommendations from the staff and they put it together in what's usually called a docket, like a board docket, and they sort of run through decisions at each board meeting. Now there are some foundations where the actual staff of a foundation has authority to make grants up to a certain amount. So where they do not need board sign off. And that can be a good thing to know when you're engaging with a new foundation, just like who's making that decision. Um, not that it should necessarily affect like how you ask for money, but it's good to understand process so that you know what all the steps will be. Um, but a third group that's increasingly starting to make funding decisions is actually like the community that's being served. Um, and this is a newer practice called participatory grant making where foundations actually cede their power um, so that the people who are being served can actually make a decision about resources that affect them. So it sounds really radical. It challenges power. It challenges traditional notions of what philanthropy is. I could talk about that all day, but I don't think you want to hear me go on about it for hours. Um, but if you do, you can ask in the Q&A. Um, the last piece I just kind of wanted to lay out for you is like, okay, Jen, you've like told us about foundations, you've told us how they make decisions, you've told us like the types of grants that they can make. How do I get money, right? That's why you're all here, right? How do I get money? Yeah, yeah, okay. Just wanted to make sure. Um, all right, I haven't totally lost you. So, so before you're gonna get a check from a foundation, you have to start with prospect research. Prospect research is figuring out where your time is going to be well spent. You can't just knock on the door of any foundation and give them your pitch and expect to get funds. There's a lot of foundations out there, like hundreds of thousands of foundations, and that's just in the US. There's a bunch internationally as well. So you have to figure out, how is my time gonna be best spent where I might actually get a grant out of this thing? So you do what's called prospect research. And there are tools out there that can help. Um, my organization, Foundation Center, has one of the most common ones um, that people use, and it's called Foundation Directory Online. Foundation Directory Online. It is a subscription service, but it's free at more than 400 libraries. Um, and we have all that information on our website, foundationcenter.org. Um, but you can basically type in like keywords for the type of work that you do, and then you'll wanna like, do some digging both on the platform and then on the foundation's website. But you wanna look at those things that we discussed, like what's the usual size of their grants? Where are they funding? What do they expect when you apply? What types of things are they looking for? Are there political ideologies in line with yours? That's actually becoming like a bigger thing and who's gonna get funding from who? Um, so really look like, is there alignment? That's like the biggest question you need to answer when you're prospecting, is there alignment? The second step is you need to figure out how to articulate what you want and why you want it. So the need and the thing you're gonna do, and you need to figure out how to articulate it concisely and compellingly. Um, especially if you are new to someone, they will not sit and just like listen to your life story. 
Um, it's really about like, how can I use data? How can I use a single powerful anecdote? How can I use my past success to frame a story that will be compelling? So figure out the need, figure out what you're doing about it. Step three is figure out a relationship. Um, you can totally send in a proposal, kind of like a cold call to a foundation, um, but the better way to do it is to have a relationship. And there's any number of ways to form a relationship with a foundation. One is to call them up. A better way is to get introduced. If you know someone who knows someone, either on the staff or a board, um, you can go to an event where that foundation is going to be. Um, you can reply to a news article that they've written. Um, a lot of foundations are, are like publishing op-eds, or you could tweet at them and let them know your activities. The possibilities are endless, but form a relationship. Step four, proposal. You need to write a formal grant proposal. And here's the thing that like I can say, and these guys can roll their eyes or validate whatever you choose. Uh, grant applications can be really annoying. Um, a lot of, they are not consistent across foundations, and a lot of funders want very specific things. And my advice to you is follow their directions, because when you don't follow their directions, as frustrating as they may be, you will probably not get funded. And that's just the reality of years and years of data that we've collected and stories that we know, and from me being a funder, like you will not get funded if you're not submitting information in the way that a foundation was asking. There are, of course, exceptions, but I'm trying to get you guys to optimize your time well, so follow the directions in writing a proposal. And then the fifth thing is like follow up. Um, some foundations will leave you hanging for a while. Some might need more information. They might want to be reminded about you if they've said no before, but you're still on their radar. So keep a strong relationship um, because fundraising is not like a one-time conversation. It's really building a relationship over time. Um, and so I would really encourage you to like stick with it, like write nice thank you notes when you get funded or even when you have a meeting where someone's taken the time. Um, offer to do a site visit for the foundation so that they can actually see your work and meet the people that you're working with. That's kind of all part of that long-term investment. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I think that's the bulk of what I wanted to say. I'm gonna throw out a couple of words and phrases as things that we can talk about like in Q&A if you're interested, um, but they weren't essential to framing anything. Uh, finding partners beyond money, like what can that look like? How do foundations help me with that? Sustainability, which is something I kind of heard come up in the room. Um, joining a board, like this all sounds cool. How do I get in on it? Um, evaluation of metrics, transparency, um, one-year grants versus multi-year grants. Um, so we can talk about all this stuff and more. And I think I think I successfully met my time mark. You did. Okay. <laughs> you did, despite the fact that we didn't give you much time. <laughs> So Jeff gave a lot of information and I just want you to take a moment to absorb that and if you have any questions for Jen right now just so you can help so that it can help you absorb that information please ask them. How's that thorough huh? <laughs> it's fantastic okay then we're gonna I think Thank you. So before we use our money to do like help home lives, so right now we wanted to get money. So first, uh, we do not have any experience. Is there some company or person can help us? Yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We've been told to use the mic. Um, the, the question was like, we don't have experience, what do we do? Um, so a couple thoughts. One, um, for grant writing in particular, there are many, many, many people who build themselves as grant writers. Um, if you're on LinkedIn or even just do a Google search, look for grant writer. They exist. Um, I would say people's experiences are either like really great or really poor. Um, what you want to do is make sure you're finding someone who's a good writer who's going to take the time to really get to know your work. There are some grant writers where their process is not, in my opinion, deep enough, and it shows when you're a funder, you kind of know if a grant writer who doesn't actually care about the work 
has written it. So just make sure that when you hire a grant writer, it's someone who's gonna take the time to learn about what you do. The other piece of this though is like building your own capacity. Like most of us have never written a grant until we have to write a grant. Um, and so organizations like mine, Foundation Center, actually offer proposal writing trainings. Um, you can start, we have a one hour free webinar. So you don't have to go anywhere. You can do it in your pajamas um, with a glass of wine, however you learn best. Um, and you can learn about proposal writing in one hour. I would recommend you spend well over an hour and like take one of our longer classes um, either with us or with another capacity builder. Um, but it, it, there is a formula to grant writing and it's, it's not rocket science, but you do need to practice it. And I think the piece that most people have the hardest time with is writing a need statement. Um, a need statement is where you articulate what the problem is that you're trying to solve. So if you're only working in downtown Chicago, the problem you're trying to solve isn't eradicating homelessness in the United States. It's solving or making an impact on homelessness in Chicago. So it's like finding a way to use data and make a clear framing that is in line with your programs and not thinking too big or too narrow. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Thank you, it's very helpful. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, do you happen to know what the percentage-wise, what's the percentage of grants that are given uh, through connections and what's the percentage through just like cold calling, letter writing, you know, grant applications? Yeah. I, Good question. Yeah. I don't have a good answer, though. Um, yeah, there's no hard data about that. Um, Anecdotally, like I think it's over half that like benefit from some sort of connection, but it doesn't have to be like a famous connection or even anything too formal. It could be, you know, I met this person at an event, we spoke for five minutes, here's my business card, I'm gonna follow up. Um, that significantly increases the likelihood. So that's like every program officer that I talk with says that it helps when there's a face behind the proposal, but I don't have a percentage for you. Okay, one last question. Where do you find all the foundations that will support certain cause? In my case, um, a few years ago I talked to a friend and we were both interested in helping a Detroit inner city kids to plant um, around their neighborhood to get some fresh produce and also improve the uh, neighborhood. But uh, um, I couldn't uh, I did, had no idea where we can find uh, the money, to where to write the grant, and sure. also once we find a certain information, support this cause, and how is there a standard format, and how do we go about approach this? Sure. Yeah. So you're in Chicago, Chicago Public Library, or wherever you are. I'm using it as an example. Wherever you are, there is a public library within driving distance or walking distance that has our database there. And everyone who goes to that library can use it for free. In the database are all grant making foundations. So that's how you find them. You go in and you use the database and you would figure out how you wanna search. So it might be starting by city and by the issue that you're working on. So you might look by you know, Illinois and food. Um, or you might look by Illinois and then the population that you want to work with, like high school, you can search by high school. Um, and your goal there is to see what foundations have funded something similar to what you're trying to do in the past. Um, and then two things can happen from there. One is that you like move forward and apply to that foundation. The other thing you could do is say, wow, it looks like their grant to this organization is exactly what I'm trying to do. Maybe I just call that organization and get involved there. And that can actually cut out the whole fundraising step and advance your goals. Can I answer that? Yeah. Sure. I think a second part of your question was how do you then apply to the foundation? So most 
not, I can't say all, Jen probably knows better than I do, most foundations have some kind of online presence, right? And best practice for foundation is to clearly state on their website whether they take um, unsolicited applications, whether they have a standard like letter of intent process where you just enter your information online. So they should be pretty clear about how they accept applications or don't accept applications. And, and for the most part, they need that, right? So if they say we don't select, they, we don't accept unsolicited applications, it's not worth your time to submit. But if they say, you know, fill out this quick form, let us know what you're doing, if we're interested, we'll reach out for you, that's probably a good use of your time. Okay, so what I learned from their talk is that I need to go to the library, I need to look for a foundation directory, then I need to narrow it down to the city, the state, whatever the, it is, and then the topic. Then next, you're gonna need to do that research where you're researching the foundation's mission. Okay, and see if it aligns with yours, etc. Find other organizations that receive the funds. Um, now, Richard, can I, also sure. I also want to speak to the connections that you already have. Okay, and how to really properly utilize the connections that you already have. Your board members, um, some of them are from uh, entrepreneurial backgrounds, and they know people. Your church, they know people, you know, influencers. Who are the community influencers that you know? And um, you should be talking with them, and hopefully some of them are on your board. And they should be helping you identify who in their networks can you get a meeting with, can you talk to, and facilitate that for you so you can get in front of these community influencers or people that have money that may have a connection to a foundation or other high net worth individuals um, or companies that can um, you know that, that are willing to give you uh, uh, some time and so I think that uh, one of my uh, things that I used to do was I used to uh, be the director of sales for one of our companies and for us uh, we had uh, incredible success with understanding our market, okay? So understanding who it is that we want to sell to and who's going to uh, really consume our goods. This is the same thing with foundations. There's a sales cycle in terms of when you first, you know, first you have to do your research, you have to make a compelling statement in terms of where is this connection between the mission of the foundation and the work that we're doing? Then it is a relationship and it is like a sales process in terms of the first time that I get rejected, just in my mind from a sales perspective, means not right now. The second time that I'm still making a connection to this foundation, I still might get rejected. It's the same thing in sales. But that just means not right now, that they need more information. And that's the sort of mindset in order that any entrepreneurial business person, that I know that there's quite a few in this room, because we are social entrepreneurs. And so because of that, that's the kind of framing in our mind that we have to have. Thank you. One more question because we need to get uh, going with our PowerPoint. Okay, I asked um, many people here and I asked, uh, they have non-profit organization, I asked them why you don't uh, apply it from the government grant and they said that uh, too much regulation is not worth it. So can you give us guidance like how to choose, for, like how to apply for the grants and then they don't kill you <laughs> by month process? Um, processing or um, maintaining, like mm -hmm. to follow the regulation, because to make it worthwhile. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question about government grant making. So, 65% of government grants is controlled by the Department of um, what's DHHS? I just forgot my acronym. Housing, Housing. Housing and Human Services. I was like, what's the other H? Um, so, 65 Health and Human Services. 
Um, so 65% of grants are controlled through that and the rest is sort of scattered across other government entities. They're all somewhat laborious like applications. They have more stringent reporting guidelines. They require slightly more specific metrics. I would suggest applying for government funding for specific projects that you do not need to rely on that funding year over year. So if you have something that is specifically aligned with a grant opportunity that you see on grants.gov, that's the website, grants.gov, um, they're always changing what they have funding for, and sometimes it's actually a really great pool of money um, that pops up there. It is a different type of application, um, and, and I can't coach you through it specifically, but I would say like if you're someone who's not comfortable with long, complicated forms, work with someone who is. Um, I actually find like kids in high school are great at this stuff because they get used to like following instructions for tests. Um, you want to be really thorough, but project support is going to be your best bet for government and stuff that is kind of contained within a year or two so that it's not like an issue if that funding goes away. I would also ask that, or, or add that you should know what the reporting requirements are for the grant, right? And mm -hmm. if you have the capacity to do the reporting. Yeah. A lot of government grants require a lot of data collection, some questionable whether or not it's useless, right? But they want it in order for you to be able to draw down the money. So like, you know, getting the grant is one thing and then being able to, to report on it and also spend it in the very specific ways that the government wants you. Like you can, you know, they have percentages of how much can be spent on overhead, you know, what can be spent, you know, if you're running an after school program, you can't buy snacks for the kids, but you can buy them drinks, like very, very specific. So just make sure you have the capacity to actually manage the grant, if you were to get it. If you don't get the grant from government, what else can you get? Um, foundations. <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to Allison to, yeah. to, to, to talk more about that. So now we're going to go into private this foundations, <laughs> different than the government grant making. I'm going to buzz through some of these slides really quickly because I think Jen covered a bunch of them. I also just jumped ahead because Jessica was talking about. Okay, so these are just a couple of, if you really want to nerd out on numbers related to this, givingusa.org does an annual report every year with all kinds of slides about giving, essentially, contributions in all different ways. So we talked about, we're focusing on this foundations piece of the pie, but you'll see the, out of all the money going out there to nonprofits, most of it is coming from individuals. Not to say you shouldn't listen to us, but just to say that individuals is also, also really important. Um, this is just where it's going, just to give you a little bit of an idea, it really goes everywhere, but you can see that religion is the biggest one, which makes sense, people give to their churches, temples, etc. And then education and human services and health are probably the other three, I'm going to ignore this, gifts to grant making foundations for this purpose today. I'm not going to get into it. And then this is the optimistic slides, giving is going up. That's great, right? There, well, there's more, yep, there's, <laughs> there is more money out there every year, um, thus far, we'll see what happens. Also, there's more money out there every year from foundations. Another optimistic slide. Um, and about half of this last year came from family foundations, which is representative here. And then this is what um, uh, both Jen and Jessica have talked about a little bit, but this is my development hat from when I used to do fundraising as a full-time job. This literally is what you do year in and year out, this cycle of getting more donors in the door. It applies to both individuals and foundations. Um, and so, if you can't read this, the first starts with identification, which is what Jen talked about a little bit, prospect researching, figuring out who's your pool of people. Qualification, you wanna narrow that pool as much as possible so you don't waste your time. Cultivation, people give to people, so you wanna develop relationships. And um, I'll go into a little bit of detail in each of these. Solicitation is the actual grant writing. If it's an individual, it's the actual asking for money. Um, and then acknowledgement is, saying thank you essentially, and stewardship is keeping them in the loop, reporting, um, kind of keeping connections, and then good news, it starts all over again because sadly you're gonna need money every single year if you wanna keep doing good work. So I think most of this Jen touched on, is there anything else new here? I would really highlight this third one, talk to your local association of nonprofits or foundations. It really varies. In Chicago, it's called Forefront. In DC, it's called Center for Nonprofit Advancement or Maryland Nonprofits. Okay. Yeah. 
So any of those, because um, that's going to be your key resource. They're probably also going to have access to the Foundation Center, at least in Chicago they do. Um, and they also will have like a newsletter that they'll send out typically with local options for applying for grants, makes your life very easy. Um, I really like Philanthropy News Digest, which I think is you guys, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> We're everywhere. Yeah, when I was uh, raising money, I signed up for these. You can get um, essentially an email if you're interested in education or environment, and they'll send you an email monthly-ish, quarterly, it's, it's daily. When, whenever a new RFP, a new request for proposals is added, okay. you'll get pinged in your email. And those are the ones yeah. that are completely open. So RFP stands for request for proposals. And those are when I'm the foundation and I am open to having people come in and ask for a grant. So I'll send a notice out to the world essentially saying, I want people to ask for money. And I want them to ask for money related to this X, Y, and Z. Right? That's yeah. how I would describe exactly. RFP. Um, Okay, the rest I think is all the same. Oh, I would also, okay, number two is what I did when I was on the cheap and did not want to go to a library or look for a new uh, database. I literally just Googled, uh, and so in Chicago I ran a, I worked with a school program that worked with schools. I literally Googled like Chicago public schools, after school programs, looked at what popped up, went to their website, looked at who was giving them money, and then added all those people to my list of who I was going to ask for money from. Yeah, it's basically what the database does, but it's just a slightly more like targeted way to do it. Sorry, not to downplay the database. Uh -huh. um, I think we talked about almost all of these. So I'm gonna just buzz through because we're a little short on time. Um, I think we talked about all of this, but just really the people part is so important. If you can get a connection, it really does matter. Uh, I think the in-person visits, if you can get someone to see your work, it makes it so much harder to say no which kind of stinks on this side now, because then you get your heartstrings pulled out and you can't say no. Um, and the no doesn't mean no forever. Jessica said this too in the sales side. Um, the only asterisk I would say is that sometimes no does mean no forever, and then just drop it. You know, if, it, if, they're, if the answer from a foundation is you're just not a fit with what we want to do, I would let it go. If the answer is we don't have money right now, you know, we ran out our budget, or your work sounds great, but it's just, maybe not a perfect fit right now. I think you're listening for those words of like right now versus forever. I think we'll talk a lot more about this kind of what's in the grant with the questions yeah, part. Yeah, I have a comment. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> I want to speak to um, how do we build capacity or what are other resources that we can utilize um, that may be low cost in nature. I also want to highlight universities because there are universities that have their own pool of money and uh, to go out there in their community and utilize the power of students and learning. And they want to have uh, experiences that are meaningful to their uh, learning in the social sector. And therefore, um, you know, there are pools of money in universities and you can connect, you can go and see if they have any kind of social sector that is, um, like I think at uh, DePaul they have uh, some asset-based um, management or what, what's the other one? Um, state Center. For the State Center. Public service. For public service. And so if you have a connection to a university, or just simply um, make a connection with a faculty member that is um, really in your, uh, you know, your sphere of interest. Make a connection to a faculty member and have a discussion around what you do. And perhaps they can open some doors for you. And perhaps, um, you know, there could be some student work around capacity building um, within your own organization. So I just wanted to give that tip, and uh, hopefully that, that helps some, some people as well. Did you want to make a comment? Oh, I just want to ask a question. Sure. Um, um, so if um, I have a proposed program, um, but I, don't, I know there's a lot of competitors that are also seeking funding for that. How can I make my proposal, my, my grant writing, more, more um, stand out, more competitive? Um, 
than my competitors. What are the what are the major factors you guys would look at? Like um, the if the budgeting is very reasonable, if uh, we have a, um, a history of doing those things, what the, I just want to know what what factors would make it stand out. Han, do you want to share? Sure. I I would say you know what is um, what is unique or different about your project versus the other projects that you might know about. Um, you know, there are a lot of organizations doing a lot of similar work <laughs> in this yeah. country, um, and um, it doesn't mean they're not all doing good work. Um, so, you know, it goes back to that question of finding a foundation that is aligned with the kind of work that you're doing and that you're proposing, and communicating that in a way that, it, that speaks to them. Right, while staying true to what you're doing. So I would say, like, why, why, what, what Jen was talking about the case for funding, right? What's the need, and how are you addressing it in a way that you really believe is particularly effective? And what, how are you backing that up? The fact that you think it's effective. Yeah, I want to answer this because what you were uh, talking about was creating a think tank type of organization, yes. and. The, what I can say to you is that there is a lot of thought around compiling data and utilizing data in a way that can uh, try to find a solution for a lot of nonprofits and how they can measure impact, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so what you should be doing is looking for foundations that want to um, focus on this area, okay? And what are you doing, or what, what is your group, how is your group uniquely positioned to not only um, you know, provide solutions to this problem, like on a theoretical level, but also on a community level. And so you have to, you have to articulate that, and you have to find those um, funders who want to do that work. And, and so if you can do that, then I think that you'll you'll be very successful with that because it's hot right now. We're all struggling with that same type of challenge. Thanks. Sure. Um, I just wanted to add to a couple things of what they said. One is just it's very individual based on each foundation. So I think one of the key things we would all say is do as much research as possible before you apply to a foundation. So some basic things like knowing the size of the grants that they make. Um, I mean, for us, just as an example, which is just an example, every foundation will be completely different, to be very clear. <laughs> we make grants anywhere from 20,000 to 250,000. Our average size is 50. Um, 50,000. So if you were to apply to a grant for us, for example, although we're invitation only, so you can't just do that, but if you were in an imaginary scenario and you applied for a grant for 250,000, you probably wouldn't get it to be completely truthful. That's a very high amount for us and it takes people who have been in contact with us for multiple years. So I think being aware of what's reasonable for each foundation is really important. Um, and knowing whether they look for new organizations or kind of existing organizations is also a really big difference. Um, a good number of foundations uh, don't typically support super new organizations. If you, for example, just got your 501c3 status, you've never gotten a grant before, your budget is $10,000, <laughs> you know, like you're just getting it off the ground, it takes a special sort of foundation who's interested in kind of the startup um, new organization and maybe you know better resources for foundations that are specifically interested in that. I know um, Echoing Green comes to mind is a specific grant just for brand new, I think it's to individuals too, to right? Individuals, yep. If you want Echoing, Echoing green. green, like Echo, Echo, Echoing <laughs> Green, the color green. Yeah. Yeah, and Jen, can maybe speak a little more about brand new. I well, yeah, for brand new, I just have like two specific thoughts. One is you don't always need to get funded as your own organization to start. So there is something called intermediaries or fiscal sponsors or any number of other names. But these are organizations that kind of do they use their fiscal oversight to help you with receiving grants. So if you're like not an established nonprofit organization yet, or if you're looking to align resources, um, you might go through one of those. Um, and I can talk with anyone who's interested more afterward on like how you might find a fiscal sponsor. 
Um, but the second thing is purely tactical um, that I just want to add to what all of my colleagues shared, which is like, to the extent that you can speak the language of the foundation while remaining authentic to your mission, that's really helpful. So a lot of founders in particular, like founders of foundations, they might have a very specific way of expressing the work that they do. Um, so back to the foundation I used to work for it, like spark creativity was a phrase that appeared over and over, not just on our website, but in like articles that our founder wrote and in interviews. And it's like, well, if that's something that you're kind of doing, use that phrase because that's gonna pop off the page in a way that you're asking, how do I stand out? Use words that are going to resonate with them. If you're saying the same thing that they are tuned into, but using different words, it's not gonna resonate as much. Was there a quick analogy to that one was just the job yep. search when you're doing your resume or cover yep. letter, it's the exact same concept. Yep. Anyone who's gotten a job, you know to use the language that the company is using. Mm -hmm. um, so exact same thing with foundations, I would say. Totally. Was there another question? Uh, I have a question for Jessica. Just a moment. Just a moment. I had a question for Jessica. I uh, see. I'm just wondering if you could tell me, because we try to help host the event at the university camps, but the university camps policy is whatever we raise in the fund is belongs to the university, not our organization. So Honan can talk and to have that situation. Yes, um, so the question was, um, the experience has been um, when working with the university, if there's um, some new activity or work that is being produced, the university feels like it, they're the owner of that work, correct? Yes, whatever you have that you deal with the fundraising, the money, chance, is belongs to the university, not to the non-profit organization. Right, right. But my point was that if you're looking for funds for the university, that's probably not going to happen. If you're looking for resources from a university, from a university, that may happen. So, because organizations need more than just money, they need capacity. They need to learn to do better within their organization. They need training. They need to learn how to fundraise better. They need to know how to um, develop a theory of change. They need to learn how can I measure my output, my impact, and how can I construct it in a document that will resonate with funders? And who can do that work for me when I have limited funds? Perhaps someone from the university, um, a faculty member, a grad student, can assist in those kind of efforts. So that is my point, that um, it's not just funds that you need, but it's also skilled um, kind of uh, people that can help you advance your mission and advance the work that you do to make you um, stronger and more sustainable within your organization. Yeah, and then I would also say, I mean, whether it's with a university or a foundation or any other funder, if they are our stipulations or, you know, expectations um, of you as a grantee and receiving a grant that you don't think are reasonable, one, you can say that, and two, you just shouldn't take the money, right? So oftentimes nonprofits, especially newer nonprofits um, that are looking for money, often do what we call mission creep, right? They're like, well, this is what this RFP is for, and our, our nonprofit kind of does this, so I'm gonna say that we do this, because we can do this. We can take on this project because there's money attached to it, but if it's not aligned with what you're actually, what your mission is, you're gonna get yourself into a lot of trouble and just spread yourself too thin. So whether that's you know programmatic expectation or a product you know a deliverable or whatever, like just be honest with yourself on what, you know, can, are, are you, willing to, um, do you feel good about being able to meet what the expectations of the grant are? Uh, 
Okay, thanks for sharing. Um, so it's great to know the grant is going up. Uh, so I want to know how do you initiate a talk with the donors, and how do you know how do you justify yourself? Like what benefits they can get from granting money? And also, I guess everybody's job is to keep somebody else happy. So by the end of the day, back to my question. Uh, how do you evaluate yourself, like, if you've done your job and how it's going to look like? Thanks. That's an interesting question, because that's what uh, Julian Grace has been working on. <laughs> so we, we do not have the answer to that, though. Um, I think that last part of your second question is kind of the million dollar question that a lot of foundations are grappling with and how we look at our impact. Um, I think it depends, once again, it depends on the foundation. Um, I think some foundations look at their impact, um, you know, pretty narrowly, like it's, it's we're focused on um, math in schools, right? And so their metrics are very clear. It's like increases in test scores in math or um, increases in the number of people going into math careers and they look at all of their grantees on the same metrics. Um, I think other foundations, so for us, for example, we fund, like I told you, a pretty broad range of things. So for us, the impact is a little bit more uh, sort of grant by grant and whether the organization has met the goals that they set out for, for themselves. So kind of back to your first question is, does an organization have clear goals? That's one of the things we look for. Um, are they able to articulate concrete, measurable goals? And then on the report side, did they meet those goals? And even if they didn't, that's okay with us, but we need to hear that they're being thoughtful about it and did they learn from not meeting their goals and then are they sort of using that information to maybe change their work the next year? So we look at it on a sort of grant by grant basis um, because our grants aren't necessarily in one clear focus area. And so while some foundations evaluate on a grant by grant basis, others might look portfolio wide, like maybe there's a goal, for example, to reduce um, poor health outcomes in a community over a 10 year period. So they would collect data that's tied to their specific goal that might not be tied to the organizations and the actual grant dollars, but they would see if there's a shifted outcome and then sort of attribute that shift or lack thereof to the work that they were funding. Um, so that's another way that some foundations choose to measure their work. I think your question of like, how do you know on an individual basis? Like, I, I actually really like the framing of that question. Um, and one friend of mine who's a program officer at a large foundation, she um, said something that I really take to heart and is not true across all foundations. So, you know, she's just an all-star. But she said, look, it's my job as a program officer at a foundation to listen to what people need and either direct resources to them when I can, when it fits with what I do, or help them figure it out. That is my job. The same way that a mechanic's job is to maybe fix a car, or your job is to advise people with wealth on where to invest that wealth. Everyone has a job, and the job of someone working for a foundation is to distribute funds. That is a piece of the role. So, um, you know, she said, I evaluate my work by if I've like done that in a way where people come to me and leave with some new resource. So it might be funds, but it also might be a connection or a new way to go about their ask. Um, and that's always stuck with me, so I just wanted to share that. Um, so we, we do not take a highly scientific approach to evaluation, but the way we evaluate whether or not we're being successful is at the grantee and program level, right? And each program, each program area has specific goals. Um, and then each specific grantee, as Jessica was saying, I'm sorry, as Allison was saying, has goals that they've set for themselves. So we evaluate themselves against themselves, right? And then also the larger goals of the program. We as a foundation also feel like it's unfair to just expect grantees to evaluate themselves, so we also evaluate ourselves, right? And so we try to achieve in everything that we do, and again, we're one very specific foundation. So for us, we look at our outcomes at three levels, right? One, as a foundation, are we being more effective, efficient, and equitable in how we do our philanthropy, right? Internally, externally, et cetera. The community, the, the grantee level is that are the grantees that we're supporting stronger, right? Has their capacity been strengthened so that they can meet their mission? 
even though their missions might be all over the place, right, as a cohort, like are they stronger now to meet their mission? And the third level for us is because we're about building power of underrepresented communities. Are there change makers in communities who are now empowered to uh, make their, their lives, their organizations, their families more equitable? So that's how we measure our impact, and we do it very qualitatively, right? So we ask people, we do, uh, we've done grantee and applicant perception surveys of the foundation. Uh, so both the people who we've given grants to and that we haven't given grants to because it's good to get that feedback And we also always ask for feedback in our grant report So we don't expect just grantees to report to us on how they're doing but on to us about how we're doing as well So we just think it's fair um, Any other questions? Is there any time preference regarding when is the best time to apply for the foundation? I work for a corporate co uh, company, not non for profit. So normally we do a business planning a year ahead of time, so we we know how to spend the money the next year. So that's why I'm asking that question. Do you have any other questions on the microphone? Just from a religious standpoint. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, because I'm a uh, I'm a reporter, so my so my question is, uh, uh, how can you separate your uh, your foundation's benefits from the donators' benefits? Uh, what I mean is, you know, uh, uh, sometimes uh, some donors uh, donators they choose to donate money is just for their own uh, benefits, their uh, their own reputation. Uh, but uh, but uh, actually, they don't know exact uh, exact exactly what they want to do. Uh, but if something bad ha uh, uh, bad things ha uh, happen to this person, uh, well, you cancel the cooperation with these donators. And uh, what else will you do? Yeah. Thank you. There's one more question here. Hi, thank you very much for all the panelists for uh, your insights. I have a, a nonprofit that's three years new, so I'm just starting to consider uh, applying some grants. So far, we're just depending on individual donors. So you guys mentioned earlier that it, most of the foundation don't fund newly, like new, basically newly started organizations. On one hand, it's kind of disappointing. On the other hand, everybody has their first time. So I just wonder how do uh, the new uh, nonprofits get their very first grant? Do you have very specific advice on that? Thank you very much. Anyone else while I'm out there? Thank you, Marjorie. I, I just have a general question, Anna. When you talk about a foundation, to me it sounds like you're the intermediary between the donor and the grantee. Is that what I understand? Because your foundation still need to seek money from different donors uh, that fits into your your objective, no? Oh, okay, that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to clarify. What what's different if the donor just set up its own foundation and give up? So that's like a family foundation, like Bill Gates or Melinda Foundation. That's the, so then your foundation you're talking about is, is that that's, I just set up a foundation and for, for a specific mission, specific objective, and whoever the donor they want to contribute, I will get money. Then I will, I will give the grantee. So. Okay, one more. <laughs> Sorry, um, I, I do apologize. I've been running around preparing for tonight's stuff, so I wasn't getting a chance to really come in to uh, um, listen too much. I really wanted to come in. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, uh, my my question is, uh, we're building a China Garden in St. Paul, Phelan Park, and it's been going on, uh, St. Paul, Phelan Park, um, China, China Friendship Garden over there. Uh, so this year, it's really started. We, uh, through individual donor, we got about a million dollars. Um, and it's, it's, we pretty much use it all. It's, it takes a lot of money. 
Uh, but anyway, the, the group has always been asking the question is, how do we go to foundation? How do we go to business? So it, there's, a, there's, uh, there's a need uh, to get a staff member, a paid position that somebody who can always do it professionally um, to go to the foundation so knows what's going on. Um, we've been talking about it, but we don't know how to hire the person that's really, really um, knows, that's you know, how do you get, you know, uh, other areas, it doesn't help us, you know, how do you find a person that's, that we can do it locally so, you know, get to the right uh, people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we're going to give it to the experts. I can start with the first one. Just bang out hard on the you can. <laughs> okay, the first one was around deadlines, like when is the best time to apply for grants. It varies by foundation. Sorry, that's my response to every question. <laughs> um, but seriously, most foundations, uh, if they do accept grants, sort of open-ended, they're gonna have a deadline on their website. Um, almost all of them would have a deadline on their website. Um, in terms of planning, though, I think a good number of foundations uh, probably plan around a calendar year. It depends on their fiscal year. For us, it's on the calendar year, so we do know our budget by around the end. So right now, we're kind of budgetarily planning for 2019. Um, although we kind of have a five to 10 year plan, so we pretty much know anyways. Um, but the deadlines are gonna be on the website. So that's, I think, pretty universally yeah. answering that one. I'm just gonna to speak to my own experience. And from, just because of the way that the foundation has been set up, we already have a trajectory of 10 years, knowing that our family is fully funding all of the activities of the foundation and all the grants that come out of the foundation. So over a span of 10 years, what we have done with our board and their assistance is look at when will we infuse the cash coming from our family wealth and how does that affect the amount of money or funds that will be deployed in any given year. So we have a 10 year trajectory and that's because that's all we can handle right now of thinking around this problem and because it affects the capacity within the foundation, how many people are we actually gonna have to hire? Do we have enough capacity to handle um, taking on more grantees? And how are we deploying it on a year-to-year -year basis, that money? So um, for us, that's how we're doing it. And I'm just going to speak to our case. Like, like everyone here has said, it's very different for each foundation how they think around this. Since we're on, on that question, um, you know, our, our foundation, when, when someone gives money, a person donates their money to a foundation and starts a private foundation, that money is no longer theirs. That money belongs to the foundation, which is you know regulated by the IRS and state laws, right? And uh, federal laws and state laws. And so um, that said, yes, usually if it, particularly if it's a family foundation or a donor is still involved, like they have a lot of decision making, um, you know, a big decision making role of where that money actually gets used. Um, and every foundation is different. You know, our donor, he set up the foundation because he wanted a way for his family in perpetuity to be engaged with um, being philanthropic and altruistic and advancing social justice. So he gave us a pot of money that we as a foundation, is, you know, drive for our staff and our board. And he has his own money that he gives separately. You know, so like, he's like, I, as long as everyone's happy at the foundation, you guys can do what you want with the money and he gives his own personal money separately through other causes. Not every foundation is like that, not every donor is like that, but legally, right, like, you, you know, the foundation is a separate entity from any individual. Right, and that's exactly what we do as well with our family. So the foundation has its own pool of money, and then as individuals, my husband and I, and also my children, have a pool of money in which they can pursue their own philanthropic activities. So I'll keep us going to some of the other questions. Um, there's the question of how do you hire a good person to lead fundraising activities. Um, the I would say one of the most common job boards um, for people who like talent who is working in the nonprofit sector is Idealist. Um, 
So you would want to post a job description there. You would also want to post one on Philanthropy News Digest, which was mentioned earlier because it sends requests for proposals. It also has a job board that's pretty widely used um, across, across the whole sector. And then a third place that I would recommend posting is if you're looking for a certain type of candidate. So if you're looking for a candidate with like specific experience in the environment or specific experience in a community, look at where that community has a job board or has a presence or has an association and post a job description specifically there. I think the core competencies that you wanna look for in someone who's fundraising um, they need to have stellar writing skills um, and like really have a high bar for that because especially if that's a primary way where people are learning about your work, um, it needs to be clearly articulated on paper and also someone who can be charismatic on the phone. Um, so someone who knows how to, for example, this is one of my like best tips, be nice to the person who picks up the phone. Don't say, Hi, I need to speak to the president of this foundation. No. That, that person is the gatekeeper. Like, when I used to pick up the phone and someone was a jerk to me, that was the end of that. So, like, seriously, be nice to that person and hire someone who's gonna know how to speak with whoever picks up the phone and whoever they're passed along to, and they understand the give and take of speaking and listening. Um, so those are some of the, the big skills that I would look for in hiring. Um, to uh, the question of like everyone has a first time and like how do you get funded as like a first time foundation. I think like I want to go back to Jessica's point that she's made a couple times which like we can't underscore enough. Relationships are like really crucial with going from I have an idea and it needs funding to getting that thing funded. Um, with, with relationships and you all have them um, you can get your first grant. Um, and an exercise that I have people do, both when they're applying for a job and looking for funding, um, they're very similar. You can take a sheet of paper and at the top write five people that you know really well. So it could be your partner, it could be someone you went to school with, it could be someone who's been a mentor to you over the years. So write five people. And then here's the tricky part, under each of them, write 10 people that they know that you don't really know. How do I do that, you might ask. Well, think about who they've talked about, think about where they work, think about the circles that they run in. And then you have your prospect list. You have 50 new people to meet. So prioritize a few of them and ask to get introduced. Build your network because you already have it. And, and that is where a lot of first grants come from, your network. Yeah, I wanna say something about um, recruiting people who are skilled in the nonprofit world. And I'm just gonna give our case study, right? Which is that we have um, an HR professional that we have utilized in our business that we have known for 20 years. And this person is, we made a connection to her that we feel we trust. And we said to her, help us recruit the right staff for our foundation. That's how we did it. So, you know, if there's people out there that have uh, companies, um, that have networks to HR people that can do this kind of recruitment, that's what, you, that's what we did. And maybe that's a tip for you all, to connect with someone who can facilitate that kind of activity for you. Okay, I had two thoughts on, um, so the China Friendship Garden, is he still here? Okay, great. I think your question was about both hiring people and then also sort of how do you pay for that person, maybe, if I understood it right? Okay, so I have one concrete thought on that is you said you've already raised a million dollars, so it sounds like you guys are already pretty good at fundraising. I, I might suggest um, finding, convincing one of your existing donors to give you like 50,000 or whatever you think a reasonable salary is. 75,000 to pay for a development person for one year, right? Get, tell them, convince them that that's what you want to, why it's important, and 
as probably if it's a business person, you're gonna explain that it's gonna tenfold increase their investment, right? You hire a good development person, maybe you convince them to give you that money for a year or two, and then you tell them that that's gonna mean that that person can then raise another 500,000, 750,000. And so I think a smart business person is gonna see that and see like, wow, my money's gonna get like, you know, quadrupled or tenfold grow. Um, I think that might be the best way to get you started because I think it's fairly rare to find foundations that are going to give you money just to, for a development person. I could be wrong. We have occasion, on occasion done it, um, but having worked at a startup, we used individual donors for things like that. And then sort of similarly on the new um, nonprofit side, I think, what was I gonna say? I wanted to echo something on that. Um, just it is gonna be finding someone who's gonna take a bet on you and I have two thoughts on who that could be. Um, one would be your local community foundation. Um, they tend to be more likely to want to take bets on new organizations that are working geographically in the right area. So um, in Chicago, it's the Chicago Community Trust, although they're extremely large and they're not a great example for that. But <laughs> in other places where it's, um, I think in Michigan, there's a really good community foundation. Grand Rapids. Yes, community Grand Rapids. Rapids. That's Rapids. exactly what I was thinking yep. of. And so part of their mission is to really support the Grand Rapids community. So if you are working in that space and you're a new nonprofit, they would be an ideal place to go. They're also going to know the entire landscape because they're a community foundation. So even if they don't give you money, talking to your local community foundation, just literally Google like the name of your closest big city and community foundation and whatever pops up, try to get in there and even ask them just for advice. Who do you think I should approach? What other organizations are doing work we should know about? People love getting asked for advice. I love getting asked for advice. I always talk to people who call <coughs> and ask me a question as opposed to the first question being, how do I get money? If the first question is, can I just take 10 minutes to ask some advice? I'll always keep talking. <laughs> okay. Okay. Did we answer all the questions? There yeah. was the second question the from a journalist that I, I, I if you can restate it for me. Oh. Yeah, the second question was that you had was that you've noticed uh, that there are donors out there that fund in a way that the perception is it's for their own benefit in some in some sense, correct? Yes. And um, I think that yes, that may be true in some sense. Um, but, the, but really the larger issue is, and I'm, and I'm sitting on the donor side, and I'm an entrepreneurial family. Uh, we are self-made with our money, and therefore we're gonna decide exactly the way in which we want it spent, okay? Because we feel that we made the money and therefore we're gonna deploy it in ways that are of interest to us. And I'm sure that every donor, like myself, probably has that same thought process. Now, um, the larger the ask, probably the um, donors want to feel good about their donation and maybe perhaps they want their name on a certain program, on a certain building. Um, and from my perspective, that's okay because, you know, you're asking them to part with their funds, their money. Now, from my perspective, I actually feel like I don't really necessarily operate that way, I've, and that's, that's just a personal choice. I'm a very transactional person, and I don't like a lot of media attention, and therefore, I actually like the work. And because I've, my, I was trained in a certain process of project management, I like engaging with um, organizations and doing the work. And therefore, I, I don't have time to um, spend doing a lot of media or uh, doing a lot of conferences. Um, and I think that that's just the way I operate. But that doesn't mean that everyone's the same way. And um, so I think that you just have to understand who you're partnering with what kind of donor you're working with or what kind of foundation you're working with. I have seen some foundations that are doing massively good work around amplifying voices that are underrepresented, you know, underrepresented, and perhaps um, there's some perception, well, they're doing this, but they're getting a certain kind of benefit. Well, you know, that's okay in my eyes because the work is getting done. 
and it's just the perceptions that are out there. And I, and I feel like, um, you know, it takes a lot of courage to actually put yourself out there um, and, um, you know, deploy money in ways that are uh, just hopefully do some sort of public good, right? And also, though, I see in the philanthropic world just a need for better training and better education because nonprofits, from my from my perspective, they're businesses, and a lot of times there's just not enough. Um, there's a lot of people with some good intentions and some and and, and, and good hearts, but but it's also a business. It's a and it's a business that needs to be sustainable in the long run, and therefore they need a lot of capacity training. And sometimes I think that there's these. Um, big newspaper articles um, saying this donor of this high net worth donor had some scandals or uh, things were not working right in their uh, organization and but that's okay in my eyes too if they sincerely want to fix it because as an entrepreneur everything I try is not going to be a success and I'm willing to take the failure because I don't have all the answers and therefore, all I can do is try and um, put together the best team that I can put together and hopefully uh, work with that team and work with the organizations to really be in partnership and really listen around, this worked and this did not work. And how can we pivot? That's the entrepreneurial mindset. How can we pivot and take our lumps, lessons learned, and then come back with, with a different solution no, I, I realized that there was a question I think you asked earlier that we never answered was um, you, you're, you're working in finance, uh, male-dominated um, sector. I would say, for the most part, philanthropy is not a male. Uh, <laughs> Dad's looking at me funny. There are a lot, so here's the thing. There are a lot of women working in philanthropy. Um, there are also a lot of men. And I guess, um, so the, the issue is that, that there is a significant wage gap between what men are getting paid and what women are getting paid, right? Um, so in the sense of like, are there a lot of other, I feel like philanthropy tends, the, the circles that I'm in, it tends to be a very female uh, dominated space, but the this, this data still shows that the men who are working in philanthropy are getting paid more than women, which is consistent with just overall nonprofit sector and the for-profit sector as well. And they have more, men also tend to have more senior roles at foundations, so the data show that more CEOs of foundations are men, and specifically white men. Um, and, you know, it's something that's like both comical and like really, really terrible. Um, we could have a whole session focused just on power dynamics that are brought about by a number of things, with race being one of the top ones. I mean, it's, Diversity, equity, and inclusion is something that a lot of foundations talk about funding but can't effectively do when it is solely white men who are leading that. And I'm I'm really proud of how you assembled this panel and how, you know, that's not who's in front of the room. And like I like I had a personal reflection today that I, I will just share. This is probably one of the first and only places where I've ever been in a minority, which is like a really, it, it's one of those things that's just like, oh, this is how everyone else feels in every single philanthropic room, and that's not okay. Um, and it's something a lot of us know, but it's it's been really slow to change. So as a woman, there's plenty of women, um, and there's still, right, the wage gap, and there's still, at least for me, a perception of a little bit of a glass ceiling because there are, there are men who have a degree of power that aren't retiring anytime soon because jobs in this sector can be really cushy at the top. Not always, but in the larger foundations, you wouldn't want to leave. <laughs> All right, I just want to make another comment that the good news is there is a lot of wealth that is being transferred right now. And that wealth transfer, guess who's leading, who, who's heading up that? Women. So that is the good news here. And therefore, like people like myself. Now, you know, like I said, we're self-made in our entrepreneurial businesses. 
Um, I'm going to be totally transparent and say that my husband was really the one that was uh, that made a lot of our wealth, but he doesn't feel like he uh, has a passion for you know working in this space, and he has his own interests, and therefore because of my background, I'm the one who's making the decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's reflecting more of you know my thought process in terms of. I'm going out and I'm working with financial institutions and I'm saying, wait a second, I want to see um, fund managers that are more women. I want to see fund managers that are minorities. And I want to see topics and I want to see those people presenting to me. And if they're not in the room presenting to me, then I'm going to find someone else, some other institution that will do that for me. I want to also say, you know, I'm not just a pretty face that stands up here <laughs> and runs around the room with a microphone. I want to let you know that Jessica is uh, my best friend. And the really cool thing about this is that Jessica and I are both minorities. We're both women, we're very strong, we have strong opinions. And one of the things that Jessica asked, the reason, she asked me to be on her board, and the reason why was that she wanted to make sure that the distribution of her wealth also goes to the Asian American community. And so my role on the board has been to look at social services, because that's where I'm in, and also to bring Asian American issues and values to Julian and Grace Foundation. I want you to know that our board is extremely diverse. We have me, we have Jessica, we have an African American, we have Caucasians on our board. It is, we have at least three men and, no, there's four. So we have four men and three women? So we are an extremely diverse board. We really look for that in our, in our grantees. And we do watch, they, we ask about the board, we ask about their employees. So that's extremely important to us. You talk about the nonprofit is actually a business. So I have a question about uh, the, sus the sustainability of the business uh, of this kind of business. I see two models. One model is um, that you keep getting a grant. It's not self-efficient. Another model is either uh, like, for example, it's a school or something like, for example, Harvard. Harvard is a nonprofit. And then they get donation, but in, in the meantime, they also get the, get the tuition. 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 And then with their endowment, they also have fund manager to grow it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so what do you see these two kinds of models? So in some, like if you're doing the nonprofit, do you, do you get pay for your service? This, I, I just see two kinds of model. Like in some community service, you, you offer it for free, but then you have to write grant again and again and again. So how do you, what's your advice on that? At what point you can charge money and get fund managers to grow your money? I want to let everyone know that we are at the end of our session, so we'll answer this question if you have more questions. Please see us afterwards. As, as a nonprofit, I just want to give you like our funding breakdown so you understand it's actually like not quite that dichotomous. So Foundation Center is a $26 million annually organization. We are not small by any stretch of the imagination. Um, half of our annual budget comes from money that we charge for services and trainings. So subscriptions to our databases and all the trainings that we offer um, make up half of that revenue every year um, and a couple other fee-for-service things. Then of the remaining half, 
Um, about 35% of that are grants from foundations, which we've been talking a lot about. And then the other 15%, which is growing, are contracts for special projects. And so that's just to say, like, it, and we also have um, funds stowed away. I, I'm not a finance person, so I, I contingency funds and like some other pocket as well. Um, and we have a, a mission related investment. So we've got all types of like funds stowed away. So you can have these hybrid models, like just because you're a nonprofit, it doesn't mean you can't charge. And in fact, that's how a lot of nonprofits sustain their services. And a large part of what we do is still offered for free. So I just wanted to like lend that example as like, you can charge as a nonprofit. The idea is that what you make goes into your annual expenses and operating budget. It's not like suddenly I get like a bonus at the end of the year. <laughs> My salary remains low um, and, and that's sort of how it works. I think I was just gonna say pretty much that, just that yeah. there is no one model. I think among our grantees, at least the nonprofits that I know of, it's fairly rare to have a business model where you're generating enough income to cover your expenses in the nonprofit and still be a nonprofit. I think most nonprofits, if they do fee for service, or we have one that runs a restaurant, and so they do almost cover their restaurant expenses, but they still raise a bunch of other money for the social services that they're providing to the people working in that restaurant. So I think the expectation that you're going to come up with a model that's going to cover your expenses is a pretty unrealistic expectation for the most part. There are exceptions to that. Um, but, and just a one quick note, there's a really funny, not funny, it's realistic, awesome post, um, a website called Nonprofit AF, um, and he writes a fantastic, he had a fantastic post called The Nonprofit Sustainability Myth, which is basically just that, what I said, that nonprofits will never be sustainable in the typical sense because we're not businesses in that way. We can't charge people for our services because we're 501c3s you're not gonna be able to charge people to the same extent that a business would, right? Um, because you're supposed to be doing good for the world. So. <laughs> so how can you make, uh, keep your enthusiasm? Oh, I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> I want to give okay. us an opportunity to thank the foundations that are here. Thank you, JGF, for coming. Thank you, Eisenberg, for coming. Thank you, Foundation Center, for coming.